Alright, Torch in Dark Souls 2, a new tool for the player introduced in the sequel. It can also be used as a weapon, but ironically, it's the opposite in power compared to the nuclear fusion caused by the Torch Hollows of the original. It was obviously just meant to provide your character with light. However, when you decide to use it as your only weapon, it will cause you to descend into ultimate darkness. As the Torch isn't merely a bad weapon, it's arguably the worst one in the entire game. Yes, worse than your bare fist and much worse than the broken ladle, which can be upgraded, infused and buffed. And the torch has none of those benefits, unfortunately. But the most obvious downside is the time limit, which is not even that noticeable when you only use it as a tool, as you might build up hours of torch time without even realizing it, but when using it as a weapon in fights that can take a very long time, that time limit can cause your very playthrough itself to go up in smoke, resulting in a softlock. So using a torch is already a form of torture, but there is also a pyromancy that allows you to become a torch, called Immolation. Which allows you to set yourself on fire, providing you with a smelter demon-like damaging aura. Which unfortunately in a lot of cases will do more damage to yourself than to the enemies around you. And before you guys start firing away, allow me to preemptively answer your burning questions. Nothing in the game can affect either the damage output or the damage you take from it. So it's a set amount of damage in both directions. Which also happens to be slightly underwhelming, especially given the cost and the risk you take by using it. And therefore it's arguably the worst spell in the game. So you might wonder, can you beat Dark Souls 2 by only using a torch and the Immolation Pyromancy? Worst weapon and the worst spell. Well they say that you shouldn't set yourself on fire to keep others warm, but I'm a generous person and also fucked in the head, so I answer that question for you. Therefore let us see if we can quite literally become the first flame or if we both literally and figuratively will go down in flames. This is the Dark Souls 2 Skull of the First Sin Human Torch run. We start off as the deprived class, mainly because if you want to be hot, you gotta play in your underwear, and we find our first torch behind the cart at the first bonfire. To be clear, the rules of the run are that I can only do damage to enemies with the torch or emulation. So manipulating the environment with any kind of equipment is fair game, and so is any form of non-damaging equipment. Which actually means I had more options available than I even made use of, but that might have something to do with the fact that I killed off NPCs willy-nilly. Well, a little willy, but not completely nilly, because by killing Marlin, we can wear his outfit, since it grants you more souls, and levels are actually going to be very important in this run. And no, that does not negate what I said about playing in your underwear, because I wasn't referring to my character. So that already took quite a bit of our torch timer, and it's obviously important at the start of the run to save as much time as possible. Now fortunately you don't need any damage source against the Dragon Rider. And to be honest, even though he goes down into the water, I think he feels like he got burned, given that he was put in this type of arena. And by collecting as much souls as we can at the start of the run, we can focus on leveling intelligence and faith. Because even though the Taurus has no direct scaling, but leveling up intelligence and faith will increase your overall fire damage output. Now of course Dragon Rider is a very rare example of a boss that you can defeat without doing damage. So given that we have some very lengthy fights ahead of us, we do need to start collecting torches to build up a significant amount on the torch timer. And we obviously don't want to waste it on regular enemies, meaning that when going through areas we are pretty much defenseless. Fortunately there are no less than 8 torches available in the Forest of Fallen Giants, although 4 require the soldier key we get from the last giant. However if we talk to Kill, we get the key to the mansion in Majula, which contains 3 torches that respawn when you use a bonfire ascetic. Meaning that a bonfire ascetic translates to 15 minutes extra torch time. However, there's a better bonfire to use the ascetic on that we chose as a starting gift, and it should already be obvious which one. However, there's another way we could save on torch time, namely by glitching the pursuer out of existence. I want you to do me a favor, Phil. What? Say cheese. Well. At least if you're fast enough, which I most definitely was not. 
Because if you sit at the bonfire fast enough after triggering the first encounter with the pursuer, he will die automatically. Unfortunately, you only get one opportunity, so given that I messed it up, that meant I would have to fight him in his normal location. And in my mind at least, a glitch is the world killing the boss for you, which would have been fine, but using the ballista is me inflicting non-torch damage, which therefore would not be allowed. But of course another factor when saving on torch time is how much damage the torch can do. And it was finally time to put it to the test in a boss fight. And the damage output is... Um, yeah. And this is the damage output we have after focusing on getting 20 faith and 20 intelligence and against one of the weakest bosses in the game. Now the worst thing is that although you can improve it, you cannot increase it that much more. So the torch cannot hold a candle to any other source of fire damage in the game or heck any other damage source in general other than broken weapons that you don't have the stat requirements for. But at least it has a unique burn effect that does uh, one damage over time. Which is... Uh, something. Oh, and as you can see, and what a lot of you probably didn't even know, you can actually two-hand the torch. It even has a strong attack and even a jump attack. Wow, mind blown. In fact, two-handing is preferable as it somehow consumes less stamina and it is a faster attack animation. Now if only you could power stand torches, that would have been pretty boss to the wall awesome sauce times infinity. Well, let's hope that we will be able to do that in Elden Ring. Now despite all of that, it only took about 6 minutes to take down the last giant, which is not as bad as you might have expected, mainly due to focusing on int and faith, because remember that even though numerically the increase is very minimal, but doing 16 damage per hit over doing 10 damage per hit is a 60% increase. So if you put it like that, it's a very significant difference. But the bosses only become stronger and more resistant the further we get into the run. And being patient is not really the issue here. The real issue of course is the fact that you literally have a time limit working against you. So not only did I need to route the run accordingly, but focusing on increasing my damage also means decreasing the amount of torch time you require. But most importantly, I needed to find a reliable way to farm torches that would not require me to waste valuable torch time in the process. So fighting the pursuer in and of itself wasn't an issue. And you would think that acquiring the ring of blades would mean another damage increase. Well, you're only half right, quite literally, because the ring of blades only boosts physical damage and the torch does pure fire damage. However, keep this ring in the back of your head because it's only half of the equation that will lead to an actual damage increase later on in the run. After the fight, I made sure to pick up the Drang Lake armor for whenever I need to tank hits, or probably more importantly, whenever I would require a poise. But other than that, something that would be very helpful when going through areas, given how we are mostly defenseless in those cases, would be a shield. However, one with less strength requirements than the one I just picked up. Unfortunately, I forgot to keep some souls for that, so that was kinda dumb. And therefore I had to wait for that. But more importantly was getting access to a fragrant branch of Yore. Not to use it to gain access to the Rune Sentinels, no, the next location would be the Shaded Woods. Because given the burden of limited torch time, I had to find a way to farm torches somehow. And that might not sound like an issue at first. I mean torches can drop from torch hollows in Huntsman Cups and down in the gutter. But not only is that drop rate very low, but using a torch to farm torches means that you are wasting time to acquire more time and only if you're lucky enough that it would actually be worthwhile. So therefore I had a better idea. But first, given that I was still at base vitality, since I had to focus on fire damage after all, so I wanted to acquire the second dragon ring, but not waste any torch time on Tark. Fortunately you don't have to, by using a strategy named after a specific product commonly associated with my country. Ik ken er wat voor me doen Frits. Ja wat een jongen. Maar je moet gewoon even kaas zeggen. Doe eens gewoon normaal man vrek de pannenkoek. Yeah, who would have thought that enemies being able to hurt NPCs could actually work in your favor for once. Although it's not exactly a very quick process, especially uh, the AI is not as great as it could be. But with enough patience, we at least now had a boost in HP and stamina. Of course, our health was still quite low, and given how long the fight against Nachka would take, I took my usual approach to play it safe, which unfortunately meant even fewer attack opportunities, resulting in a fight over 20 minutes long, even though this boss is specifically weak to fire. In fact, against this boss we did 2 burn damage. Jesus, tap dancing Christ on a hot plate. Someone please nerf this level of OP-ness. op <laughs> I mean, I mean like in the sense of overpoweredness. You know, OP-ness. Well, ironically the real dick in this fight was Natsuka, 
Because even after all the lengthy fights I've had with her in the past, she did something I never experienced before. And I don't want to f fuck up this uh, late in the... in the fight. Well, that's also not very safe, actually. Huh? How does the magic behave when you don't... when she's... Ah, what the fuck? Ah, that's weird! Uh-oh, it's not good. She's on the... Oh, fuck. Let's quickly heal. I know where she is. Yeah, that's weird. So the magic stays... Okay, that's a, that's a shitty mechanic. <laughs> yeah, a surprisingly lengthy fight. But the whole point of going here first is to no longer have to worry about torch time. Because now we have a rather tedious but at least effective way of farming torches. In Brightstone Cove there are two boulder traps and one of the peasants is holding a torch. Meaning that he can also drop torches when killed. So without having to use one ourselves, we can simply use the environment to our advantage. It's not exactly a quick process, but the point is that we are no longer limited to the torches that we find out there in the world. And to emphasize again, the Torch Hollows Enhancement's cups are a really bad source for torch farming. Since their drop rate is very low and you don't have traps that you can lure them into. Moreover, as a man of culture, I'm a big fan of traps. I'm not a big fan of ambushes though. And unfortunately, the game mechanics do not allow you to burn the bridges behind you. Well, contrary to my expectations, the Skeleton Lords fight didn't take as long as I expected, as I thought it would be around 40 minutes. And I made sure to acquire the Stone Ring first, otherwise I wouldn't do enough poise damage to the Lords themselves. Well, I still had to tank hits, but that's kinda what this fight is all about. Of course, the real dangerous part are the Bone Wheels, so I made sure I dealt with them first, and that I used Alluring Skulls to make sure that I wouldn't be wheeled to death. After all, the only good wheel is a Goblin deal. Still, that depleted quite a bit of our Torch Timer, and we don't want to farm unless it's absolutely necessary. But fortunately there are a couple of torches along the way to the Covetous Demon. And what do you know, I got invaded by Forlorn. And it didn't even matter since I forgot to light my torch and I was about to get Mannequin to death anyway. So, a quick run back and then the Covetous Demon fight happened. Well, it happened for a long time. But not a lot is actually happening for that amount of time, as you probably already expected. The road to Mipha was obviously quite annoying without a proper attack and evidently without enough poise damage or without enough poise ourselves in order to burn the windmill. So that kind of sucked. But what sucks even harder is that even after you burn the windmill, there is still a poison pool surrounding Mipha's arena. And that is an issue because given our low damage output, whenever she's in the poison, she would basically regain health faster than you would be able to drain it. So it was an immense struggle to keep her away from the edges of the arena which paradoxically requires you to stay close to her. Meaning you have to deal with the double hitbox of a tail swipe. And in fact I even got caught by a rare grab attack. Moreover, Mipha can actually hit like a truck, especially given that we still don't have that much HP to work with. So this was actually quite a struggle I must say. But after ending the first stream and getting some rest, I was able to best her at the start of the second stream. And that means access to Iron Keep. Meaning that we're finally getting close to the Immolation Pyromancy. Yeah, I can't wait to set myself on fire. Of course, speaking of fire, everything here is fire resistant. But fortunately, the stone ring came to my rescue and allowed me to knock the first knight of the bridge. And the same applies to the invader. At least if I didn't hit the side of the staircase. So let's try again and let's position myself a bit more careful. Are you kidding me? <sighs> if cookies could reproduce sexually, I would say son of a biscuit. Well, at least the smelter demon is not a mandatory boss and can be skipped. And after another suicide run in Belfry's Soul, I was finally able to get my hands on the Immolation Pyromancy. Now all I would need is a Pyromancy Flame, and then at last I would be able to make sure that this girl is on fire. Which uh, reminds me of that Alicia Keys song. You know, uh, I keep on falling. Anyway, so I went down the gutter because the regular Pyromancy Flame is beyond the Flexal Sentry. And fighting them with the torch would be kind of an issue because of the water in that arena. Whenever you roll, you extinguish your torch. Fortunately, there's another Pyromancy Flame, and because Immolation sucks so hard, it doesn't even matter what the Pyroflame skills with, or whether it's even upgraded or not. Because nothing can improve it. However, despite all of that, I was actually surprised to find that especially when you combine it with a torch, my damage output was pretty decent against the Rotten. Of course, decent in context. And I did go through all my casts, and you would have to constantly be mindful of how much health you have. After all, you're constantly losing health over time when using it. So when things get a little too hot under the collar, you will likely need to move to safety in order to heal, but that also means that the enemy is outside of your damaging aura. And a single cast only lasts 30 seconds. 
And of course, another issue is that if you have to literally incinerate yourself in order to achieve victory, it might be kind of a Pyrrhic victory. Well, at least I still have my personality. But with the Rotten defeated, we've not only gained our first Great Soul, but we also gain access to an actual damage boost. At least once we acquire the key to the Sunken King DLC. And that means defeating the two giants. And I thought I was being clever because there is a way to sort of cheese that fight by quitting out after the first giant dies, which for some reason gives you the key when you reload the game. But in order to be able to quit out, there cannot be an invader present. So I made sure to go through the fork wall first to send him home. But then the game cheesed me back by immediately having him invade again. And I didn't even notice that. And the people in the chat didn't uh, tell me because they're all a bunch of sadists who like to see me suffer. Maniacal laugh. <laughs> 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 You're very welcome. But uh, the thing is that I uh, lured the giants into the tunnel in order to separate them because <laughs> god damn it dude our hitboxes suck. Where they can literally hit you when they attack in the opposite direction. But then when the first one went down and wanted to quit out, I found out that I couldn't. So the way you do this is now you can quit Hey, why can't I quit out? The invader was gone, right? What the hell? Why can't I quit out? I cannot quit out uh, for some reason. I, I went through the fork wall specifically to send the invader back home. So what happened? Uh, guys, do you, what, second, what the fuck? But instead of sitting down in sackcloth and ashes, I said fuck it and I just killed the other giant as well and got the key that way. So the reason for going into the Sunken King DLC was to acquire Flint's ring. Because here's the strange thing. The ring of blades doesn't boost fire damage, but since Flint's ring provides a flat damage boost, these rings basically boost each other. It's not exactly a big difference in damage output, but every little bit is welcome when you hardly do any damage at all. Of course, it only applies to the torch. And speak of which, there are a multitude of torch pickups in this DLC. Even a stack of five near the BDSM tree. And yes, there is a BDSM tree in this game that repairs your gear if you hit it with a whip. Pfft, what a simping sapling. But it's a good thing that I went to the DLC for that extra damage boost. Otherwise, the congregation fight would actually have been a major problem. <laughs> Which is perhaps hard to imagine, but remember that the two priests have healing miracles. And if your damage is too low, you will not be able to out-damage their healing. But by combining the torch with Flint's ring, the ring of blades, and of course the emulation spell, we were in fact able to prevent getting stuck in a healing loop. Now something I hadn't really considered, but in retrospect could have been very helpful, was to follow Creighton's and Pate's questline to get the engraved gauntlets. Now not that a critical attack with a torch would add much by itself, but when a fight takes this long, those critical hits will add up over time. Not that much, but I thought I should at least mention it. Now when it comes to Freya, I always make sure that I'm holding a torch to keep the small spiders away. But despite our weakness to fire and our newly acquired damage boost, it uh, really is only effective against the small spiders. But you probably would have expected that by now. However, you can actually inflict damage to her body, not just her head, with the immolation spell. No less than one damage per tick over time. <laughs> Holy fuck that they never decided to nerf this, OP this overpoweredness. So whenever she goes ballistic, not only can you wait it out by standing next to her, but you can even inflict massive hellfire inferno levels of damage upon her at the same time. So about uh, a billion years later, round it up a bit, the second great soul goes down. And next up would be the lost sinner. However, instead of going past the ruined sentinels, I chose to go past the flexile sentry mainly to acquire the regular pyromancy flame. Now, that might seem redundant given that immolation isn't affected by anything, but the real reason is that I wanted to have a backup system in case I wouldn't be able to get past the biggest obstacle in this playthrough. And in case you think it's the old Iron King, no it's not, but I'll come back to that later. However, this did mean that I would have to rely on immolation exclusively, since rolling through the water would extinguish your torch. However, torching yourself works perfectly fine on the water for some reason. Hey, if we're underwater, how can there be a- Which is actually not as crazy as it may sound, because there are certain substances that can burn underwater. Like uh, magnesium, thermite, uh, 
apparently human flesh. And because the Flexal Sentry is a low level boss, despite the fire resistance they get from the water, the damage was actually not all that terrible. And staying in front of the sword side with a shield also turned out to be very effective. Now obviously the lost Sinor has way more health, but despite the fact that I thought she was fire resistant, apparently it's not that high. Of course that's again within context, because you can literally do more damage by simply punching her. Even punching her with the pyro flame is more effective. But the point is that it's more than I would expect. Now speaking of fire, because I went past the Flexal Sentry, I did not have the key to light the fires in this arena. But then again, I am the light in this fight. Oh, by the way, in case you don't know, when the Sinner holds a sword in front of her face, that's actually a parry. So if you attack her when she's doing that, you essentially get Makiri countered. I have no idea if a torch can even be parried in the first place, but I certainly wasn't willing to find out. However, now the lost Sinner became the Sinner who lost, there was one more great soul remaining. And if we're speaking of fire resistance, we're talking about a boss who is literally standing in lava. But first we need to get there of course. Unfortunately, that means going the long way around through Belfoy's soul, because we don't have access to the bonfire beyond Smelter Demon. Fortunately, when we make it through, we can easily lower the platform, or hardly lower the platform. And then the only thing that could go wrong is uh, getting an arrow in the butt, but uh, the chance of that happening is, uh, well, about 100%, I guess. However, after that, we have to deal with two Alon Knights upon the girder, or beam, I mean, we discussed that at length in the chat, because we're all a bunch of fucking philosophers slash construction workers there, I guess. But with the right angle and the stone ring equipped, you can just barely knock the knights over the edge. And then after pushing the turtle into the fire, which is arguably even crueler than jumping on them, like certain Italians do, we were able to make it to the next bonfire. Well, so far so good, because I had to make sure that I had one hell of a torch counter. Because who knows how long it would take to burn the old Iron King to death. Which is surprisingly possible at least, because contrary to Dark Souls 1, there are no bosses that are immune to fire. However, Old Iron King does have 90% fire resistance, resulting in only 6 damage per light attack, minus the 1 burn damage over time, and 8 damage per strong attack. Immolation actually did more than that, but once the casting ran out, I decided to not replenish them with a herb. Because when a fight takes this long, it's better to just be patient and not take unnecessary risks that could get you killed. Especially given that the true boss is the lava pit in the back, meaning I was constantly between two fires for the entire length of a very lengthy fight. So, how long does it take to take down a lava monstrosity with a flame on the stick? Uh, not as long as I expected, I thought it would take over an hour. But it wasn't nearly as bad as that. However, he did keep me as busy as a cat on a hot tin roof for 42 minutes before he finally fell victim to my flaming toothpick. Got him! <laughs> this might be the world first uh, old Iron King with uh, only a torch and... Uh, a little bit of uh, immolation. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> so, with the final great soul in our pocket, it's finally time to make our way to the castle. Surprisingly, we were able to keep our torch lit despite the very localized rain. I suppose it would take a real downpour to extinguish it. Yeah, keep that in mind for later. Now, using it to gain access to the castle would prove to be a hassle. Well, <laughs> first of all, because I accidentally triggered the cyan knight. So, uh, pro tip, don't do that. But the real issue was the ambush that occurs when you try to attack the crossbow soldier near the left golem. So my initial idea was to slowly kill each of the soldiers one by one by separating them and knocking them over the edge because you do just enough poise damage to them if you have the stone ring equipped. However, then I realized how obviously unnecessary this approach was since I could simply use that first separated soldier to activate the golem statue instead of the one guarding it with the crossbow. In fact, when I made it to the bonfire, one of the soldiers was following me, which allowed me to use him rather than the far more resilient stone soldiers to open up the next door. But uh, yeah, that was enough for the second stream, so I called it quits and then I baked myself some cheese schnitzels. And I also thought that it would be a smart idea to use the time in between streams to go through the very tedious process of farming desert sorcerers for the Ligwing Dragon Crest Ring Plus One for a longer immolation time. And also wilted dust herbs so I could refill my castings. But most importantly, for their outfits. After all, if you want to be cute, you go for the pupa armor. But if you want to be hot, you can't go wrong with the booba armor. Fortunately, I was able to get all that stuff before the heat death of the universe occurred. So when the first stream started, I had all my stuff ready and firmly supported by the chest piece of my new outfit. Meaning I was ready for the encounter with Bimmy and Jimmy. Obviously, I wanted to focus on Bimmy first, since he has the lowest health pool. 
But the problem is that he's out of reach. But a little fire is quickly trodden out. So with some help from Jimmy, we were able to hold Bimmy's feet to the fire. In fact, his health pool is so low that we actually saw yellow in the boss's life bar when doing damage. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore. And speaking of fire, the amount of times Bimmy can fire arrows isn't actually based on any amount of arrows, but on his life bar. So no matter how long it takes, he will keep using his bow until he has about 20% health remaining. And after that, it's just a matter of acting as uh, Jimmy's personal butt warmer. God damn it, I forgot to pick up the praise the sun gesture, which I always perform in front of this altar. Well, at least given that the ladder is coming up, I could make my usual snake eater reference. Well, my idea was to uh, sing it uh, like I was on fire, but uh, yeah, the result will probably make your ears burn. So I like uh, ah, I want to thrill to the darkness inside from the night. Ah, I'm searching and I'm melting quite literally uh, to you. Uh, fear my heart, but you're so supreme. Ah, uh, it's still the deep snake here. Okay, that didn't really work that well, but yeah. Well, anyway, as I learned in previous runs, you can separate the two mannequins, which is really helpful if your damage output is very low. Unfortunately, the emphasis is on the word can again, because they don't always want to play along. Fortunately, when they moved back, they actually separated themselves, so that worked out fine regardless. And then I thought it would be smart to acquire Gower's ring from Horsey Horsey. And if you wonder which one is Horsey, that's the one on the right. Which I did specifically for the Shrine of Amana, even though it didn't end up doing much. But at least it does more than our sources of damage do against the Mirror Knight. All those hit points will be lost in time. Like torch in rain. Yes, now it's time for the biggest obstacle that has been looming over me right up until the previous livestream session. Because until that point, I still had no idea how I could possibly get past the Mirror Knight. In my test run, I pretty much came to the conclusion that I would have to bend the rules in some way to make up for the lack of a torch. For example, by punching with the Pyro Flame while guiding the invaders around the arena. Because immolation exclusively with two invaders around? That would inevitably result in complete annihilation. Moreover, Mirror Knight and the invaders have the same fire resistance as Smelter Demon, believe it or not. And the boss can resummon the invaders endlessly. So, would the run go up in smoke? Or could I somehow rise from the ashes? Well, right after the second stream, I happened to find what I was looking for. Discovered by accident by one of the original Dark Souls giants, Lobus Jr. Oh man. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, help. Oh man. No! Wait, where did the guy go? Where did the guy go? <laughs> oh, there he is! He's, a, he's out of bounds! He can't get in! <laughs> Fucking amazing. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> He's like, what the fuck do I do? Mom! Mom! So when I saw this, I was like, The winds of change are blowing. There's excitement in the air. Can you feel it? It's electric and magical. Yeah, well, the point is that I now had the strategy I needed. And you know what that means. I want you to do me a favor, Phil. Tell me what you need. I'm the make it happen guy. Say cheese. Cheesy hues. Well, unfortunately, this requires you to be in a very precise location, or better said, it requires the boss to be in the correct position when he summons. I actually set a timer to recognize when he would summon, which is around 1 minute 10 seconds, and then again on 3 minutes and 10 seconds. Unfortunately, because you have to do this for both invaders, it matters where in the wall they would get stuck. So obviously the first attempt wouldn't work, so I had to bone back and try again. And when I re-entered the arena, I did not have the greatest start. Okay, that would have been more appropriate in my butterfly run, but back then I wasn't looking at the stream chat on a separate screen. However, this time I was able to get both invaders stuck in the wall, and to be clear, they have to be stuck and not glitch completely out of bounds, because that kills them, meaning that they can be resummoned by the boss. But as long as the two invaders are still alive, no new ones can spawn in. Meaning that this allowed me to have a one-on-one -on -one fight with the boss. The damage of immolation alone is not uh, very high. Fortunately, because I'm a Dutch guy, I had more than enough weed in my I mean, after farming the Desert Sorcerers, I had more than enough herbs to uh, replenish my spellcasts. So after about another 20 minutes of being a flame in the rain, 
The Mirror Knight's life bar went down the drain and we made it past the biggest hurdle of this run. Moreover, in the chest next to the elevator, there are free bonfire aesthetics for 45 minutes of torch time. Well, of course, with the biggest obstacle of this run out of the way, we now have the biggest obstacle in any playthrough, namely the spam boost in Shrine of Amana. First of all, I was fat rolling by accident, and Gower's Ring did not exactly last very long without repair powder. And even with the Ring of Giants equipped, I did not have enough poise to make it through the fork wall. So I had to combine it with enough pieces of the Drang Lake set, which did seem to work. Now, fortunately, the area itself is harder than the actual boss that's guarding it. Even though Kermit the Cancer has very high fire resistance because of the water in the arena, similar to how the rain boosts the fire resistance of the Mirror Knight, fortunately, the moveset of this boss is about as shallow as the depth of the water in this arena. In fact, I did not even have to worry about extinguishing my torch by rolling. That's how shallow the water here is. By the way, in case you uh, guys wonder, I didn't even mention that, but you can simply roll in this arena even with a torch. You see, if I roll, the torch doesn't go out because the water isn't deep enough. Now you say amazing comedy and soothing tones. My voice is not soothing, why do people keep saying that? I have a terrible voice. On top of that, when the boss has foreskin mode activated, you can still do chip damage with immolation. So it's a lengthy fight, but not much of a boss fight. I mean, Kermit does have a life bar at the bottom of the screen, but we all know that the Cyan Knight in front of the door is the real boss of this area. Especially when he gets back up from a specific other type of froggers. So I don't know what's up with them in this run. They either crash through doors or they end up guarding them. So then we got to the Undead Crypt and uh, well Eggdine seems to have uh, very peculiar standards for what he regards as producing light. Do not produce light, I'm on fire you dick. <laughs> Bro, I'm literally... How close can I get? <laughs> he doesn't even react to it, what the hell? I don't know, maybe he means that we shouldn't manufacture sugar-free products or something. Well, at least I can tell that big boy Velstad chooses beef over sugary snacks. And you would think that cooking him well done would be easier than the previous bosses, since Velstad doesn't have as much fire resistance as them. However, he has a rare ability, well there are other examples, so um, a medium rare ability. Namely that he can buff himself, which increases his overall resistances quite significantly. So, in a matter of speaking, the second half of his life bar is 75% of his total health. Because you will only do about half the amount of damage. And because of his giant hitboxes and hard hitting attacks, I decided that it would be much safer to stick to my burning stick exclusively. Especially because you can easily take damage from the end of his swings. Now, it wouldn't have been much easier and much more consistent and a kind of an obvious way of handling this principle to just dodge back and forth rather than twice in the same direction? Yeah. Yeah, it would. Well, then again, when a chat like Velstad swings his huge bell end around, you pretty much just have to accept that you will get it all over your face. And speaking about getting blasted in the face, especially when a fight takes this long, you might want to actually think through where and when you heal in a panic, or else you will get another near death experience. You know what? <laughs> Let's just uh, drink. Uh... Oh, wait. Oh! Oh, that was. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, a good uh, decision to use the blessing. What the fuck? Okay, that was. Uh... That was a little messed up. But now we have him. Good. <laughs> okay, that was really stupid to mess up like that near the end, but uh, <laughs> that was almost a very, very big oof. So after another 20 minute fight, we finally get access to a new source of fire damage. Yeah, very few people might even be aware of this at all, but the King's Ring boosts fire damage. I have no idea why it does, but it does. So it's not merely a key. But before going to Alias Keep, I wanted to get the Throne Wanker and Throne Defecator out of the way, because most of you know by now how much I hate that duo, and you would think that they would be practically impossible under these circumstances. But there is a way to give them an even sicker burn than any torch or immolation damage could possibly inflict. And that is to cheese the throne wanker quite literally into oblivion. I want you to do me a favor, Phil. Sure. I... Uh, what the fuck? Say cheese. Mmm. The cheese is delicious and melted well. I can't say I know of a consistent way to do this, but there should be one, since certain speedruns make use of this. But in my case it had more to do with luck, and I happened to get lucky extremely quickly. Your partner died! Ah, 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 Dude, that is the best dead scene ever! No! So you would think that in any practical sense, the fight would be over already. Well, when you have that mindset, you're bound to get greedy, and when you're already draining your own health bar with immolation, that means this can happen. Oh fuck, well, that's not smart. 
Okay, I have to watch out with emulation because they... Oh, fucking hell! Oh, I'm an idiot. Fuck. It's the most basic rule in the Souls game. Never get greedy because you will get punished for it. And I still did it. I most definitely experienced that because it took me several more attempts to make the wanker fall off again. So when I finally did it, I decided to take a more careful approach and not use immolation to begin with and just rely on my torch instead. Now there is one problem with that though, even though the defecator has no decent fire resistance, but you will get very few opportunities to attack him because of his shield. Now sure, you will still get the burn damage, but uh, yeah, that is a slow cook. Fortunately, once he gets to half health, he puts his shield away, or better said, it magically disappears, meaning that it's the opposite situation of Velstad. The second half of the fight goes much faster. He also apparently was only carrying two gold pine resins or something, so the extra added danger of his lightning wasn't all that severe. But still, this took quite a bit more time than I expected. In fact, I was getting so impatient that I almost wanted to use immolation again. However, a burnt child dreads the fire, so I wasn't going to make that same mistake twice. Fortunately, now we have access to Alias Keep, we no longer have to worry about torch time. Because you can farm infinite bonfire aesthetics from one of the petrified hollows. And that's a good thing because Immolation is obviously not effective against the Guardian Dragon, or against anything else, but specifically not against the Dragon because he flies around so much that you don't get that many opportunities to inflict damage to begin with. So again, Torch damage exclusively, resulting in another lengthy fight. But I pretty much got used to that by now. But after fighting fire with fire once more, the end finally came in sight. So after a quick run towards the Ancient Dragon, with every enemy on our tail because after all, the whole point is that you are required to fight the giant knights to show you're worthy to have an audience with the ancient dragon. You know, because fighting fire resistant bosses with a burning stick is apparently not sufficient. We quickly bone out and you would think that now nothing would stand in our way anymore. After all, the giant lord is one of the easiest bosses in the game. But here's something you may not know, or it simply never even occurred to you. Namely that the fight against the giant lord has a 5 minute time limit. Yes, unlike Sorolan, the memory timer does not stop during the boss fight. Now, normally you would easily beat this boss within 5 minutes, but given how low our damage output is, and the fact that the timer starts the moment you enter the memory, meaning that you need to get your ass to the boss as quickly as possible, even if you ironically have to burn yourself along the way, but even going as fast as I possibly could, you only have barely enough time to get enough damage in. And it's a double-edged sword, or a candle burning at both ends, because if you focus on dodging, you're wasting time. But getting hit means that you get knocked on the ground, which also wastes time. And of course you have the usual camera shenanigans, because this boss is so fucking well designed. And well, would it even be possible to get enough damage in like this, in such a short time? Oh fuck, no, not good. Oh, I need a little bit more damage. No! No! Quick, get the final hits in! Okay, it should count now. Okay, it should count. I have to. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> oh, I even have enough time to pick up the soul. Good. Ooh! That was close. <laughs> <sighs> what a relief. How terrible would it have been if the run would have crashed and burned at the Giant Lord of all bosses? And so close to the end. However, we did make it to the end. Only the final boss remained, Nashandra, who unfortunately, like always, despite visually being a great design for a final boss, was kind of anticlimactic. I mean, yes, the curse orbs were extra dangerous this time, because I was already losing life from immolation, but even with a torch you can destroy those, or simply lure Nashandra away from them. So that was basically it. The ending to the torch and immolation only run. Now I'm not sure how many people watching this would want to try this for themselves, but in case you do, then I hope that sharing these tips and strategies allow me to pass a torch to my fellow masochists. But in my case, uh, at this point, after all those lengthy fights, I was pretty burned out. Eh, having said that, where there's smoke, there's fire. Smoke. So, if there's time left before the release of Elden Ring, who knows what could still happen. Are you smoking yet? But for now, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want early access, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and remember kids, that smoking is bad for your health, and setting yourself on fire may also be quite detrimental to your well-being. See you next time!